this is a really, really special treat for me to have Congressman Mark Desaulnier and Isabel Boiso here with us today. Um, if you were following their story, Isabel's story about a year or year and a half ago, um, Isabel, you, you'll, you'll hear and you'll see her story. Um, it's just remarkable um, what they were able to do together to change the path of Isabel's um, outcomes and her family. And it was, they, they were threatened to be deported. Um, and what happened is they used power to change that. Um, representing California's 11th Congressional District of Walnut Creek and the majority of Contra Costa County, Congressman DeSaulnier has spent more than 30 years in public service and is a small business owner leading the charge for working families. During the time, his time in the US House, Mark has passed more than 60 legislative efforts. He is an effective legislator who knows how to get things done. And that was definitely on display in his partnership with Isabel. Um, Isabel Boiso is a 25 year old advocate who works hard to make a difference in the life of people with rare disorders. Isabel was born with a medical condition called MPS6 and can understand the realities of living with a rare disease. She has dedicated much of her life to educating policymakers and the public about the barriers faced by patients with rare disorders. She says, I have learned to use my voice and yes, she has. I am really excited about our first session here for you today. Um, to introduce them, I'm going to bring our sponsor from the Arc of San Diego, Anthony DeSalas. Everyone, please enjoy this first session. Good morning. I'm Anthony DeSalas, President and CEO of the Arc of San Diego. We are proud to be a sponsor of the 14th Annual Developmental Disabilities Public Policy Conference. Thank you for joining us for our next session. Moving Mountains, the story of creating and using power. It is my pleasure to introduce Congressman Mark de Saulnier and disability rights advocate, Isabel Bueno, who will share more about creating stories that move mountains. I hope you enjoy this session. Thank you. Well, Congressman de Saulnier and Isabel Bueso, um, we are thrilled that you guys joined us here today at our conference. And we're talking about power today and power for the disability community and how to find power, how to use it. And of course, uh, you guys found it in a way that changed not only one life, but uh, ultimately the lives of many as well. And so um, we're thrilled to be able to have you guys share your story and we just saw a little bit about Isabel's story in uh, a video of her testimony. And now you guys kind of get to give us the behind the scenes look about how you guys were able to move this mountain together. Um, Isabel, would love to start with you. Just tell us uh, more about yourself, how you and your family came to the East Bay and what you've been up to and accomplished the last several years. Okay. So um, I was born in Guatemala and I was born with a rare disease disorder called MPS6 um, that is not really recognized um, in Guatemala. And my family um, discovered a, well, before, you know, me coming here to California, um, I was diagnosed with MPS6 in, in Miami hospital. And at that time, the only solution was to do a bone marrow transplant. But I was going back and forward, but um, as a result, there was no good match for me to do the bone marrow. So we went back to Guatemala and then my family found a magazine through a little boy who has a PS1. And then my mom emailed Dr. Harmitz and then he said, bring your daughter. So I came here, you know, invitation from doctor from UCSF to be part of the last clinical trial uh, for MPS6. Okay. And so I've been here since 2003 and I received a weekly infusion every Friday um, to help, you know, my body. And, and I'm very fortunate that I still get to see you know, some doctor to monitor, you know, with this rare disease. And so that's how 
pretty much I came, I came here. And some of my accomplishments, you know, several years. Um, well, so I graduated from college. That's one from Cal State East Bay in 2018. I've been an advocate for the MPS community to share my story. And then for the past eight years, I've been um, raising awareness for rare diseases. Um, that is very important to me. And and I just um, been part of for the third time with uh, organizations with the uh, National MPS Society. Um, that usually this group, they go to DC um, to talk to, you know, um, legislators and lawmakers, you know, about how to support more the rare disease um, community, which that will happen next week on Monday. It's going to be virtual, so I'm very excited. And then I also been going to the Sacramento Capitol too, to talk to assembly members. So that's pretty much like my advocacy, you know, journey pretty start very young. Um, but it's a passion that I have and I still have it till this day. And, and it's been going great. Yeah. And just recently, um, I'll be starting soon a, a job, which I'm really excited. Congrats on the job. That's fantastic. Thank you. So you and your family came from Guatemala, ended up in the East Bay, and um, obviously since that time, you've accomplished quite a bit. Um, so what happened about your immigration status? Walk us through when and how did you find out about this challenge, um, and what were you feeling? Okay, so my family, we are in this status called different action. And we have to renew every two years. And we have been doing this for many years with no no issue. So in 2019, mm -hmm. it was the time to, you know, do again the renew. Mm -hmm. And it was a Friday, I remember. It was on August 16. Um, I was really being done with my treatment that day. And my mom and I we were coming out, you know, the lobby. And my mom got a call from our immigration lawyer saying that he received the, the letter, but it has been um, denied. And the worst part is that we have to leave in 32 days. So at that moment, I remember my mom and I, we were just crying, you know, in the hospital, you know, and in the shock too, like, what are we gonna do? And you literally don't have enough time, right? So it was scary um, for me and many for all our family because we were not expecting this um, this change, you know, because we, like I said, we have been, you know, renewing every two years with no issue. And I think this is, you know, this just happened. So um, it was very, very scary situation. And I think the first thing that my mom did after, you know, crying was to go to Congressman Sonia's office and make an appointment to speak to him about this serious, you know, issue. So you were given a letter, said 32 days, is that what it said? 33. 33 days for you and your family to leave. And we just learned obviously a lot about the treatments you receive and the incredible um, care that you receive at UCSF. Yeah. You can only imagine how terrifying that must have been for you and your family to think about. And it. also being part of many, you know, clinical trials as well to help more, um, you know, more, so, you know, people with MPS too. So, yeah. So it was like a whole package because my mind was thinking, well, first of all, what's going to happen with my treatment, obviously, because I've been for so long and had to help my body um, to live longer because um, that's one of the things that it helps, you know, um, so another thing is, you know, my team of doctors that has been, you know, monitored for many years. So it was a pretty shock news for, I think, everyone, my family. We're going to talk with your mom in just a bit and go to make an appointment with Congressman Solny. I'm definitely going to ask her, how did, how did she know what, what, what empowered her to do that? Well, here, here's the thing. We knew about Congressman the Senate office because, as I mentioned to you, I've been part of a group with the National MPS Society advocates that they go to DC, um, usually, you know, for the week of rare disease, um, rare disease day. And my first time, you know, being part of the team was in 2017. So I actually met Congressman Sonia and some of the staff even before meeting him in person. 
So I remember, you know, in being in those, um, uh, you know, meetings that, you know, he had an office, you know, in, in Water Gray. So we went in, but I mean, that was the first instinct to my mom. She said, you know what? I mean, you know, in the beginning we cried, we were shocked and everything, but we thought we have to make action. Like we cannot just sit there and do nothing, you know? So the first thing she thought it was to go to uh, his office, you know, Congressman Sonia's and we, we got there and we made an appointment to do to, to see him. So one important note is that you had a relationship before you went to make an ask, huh? So that's an important note to, to make also, building relationships across the stakeholders, across the people that you can get support from. So one more question for you, Isabel, before um, some questions for the congressman, but um, obviously you, you decided to fight. Where did where do you think that courage came from? Where where did your desire to fight come from? Well, first of all, I would change the term fight. It's more I think about the opportunity that I had to take an action to make a big change. I think the the you know the the I mean, first of all my family, um, I get that from my family, but also having God with me. But I feel like. The character, I think I got it from my mom. <laughs> because as you remember, Jordan, she was part of the partners in policy making with you a long time ago. And and I think that kind of helped, you know, my mom, you know, kind of, you know, did that training to educate your parents, you know, when you have a kid, you know, with disability and everything to know that they have their rights. So um, I think I got that credit from my mom. <laughs> And obviously, you know, my, my dad and my sister, my whole family, and, you know, having God with me. Um, but I think what's more, um, instead of like fight, um, I think in my mind, what's more about, we just cannot sit there and we need to make an action to, you know, help, you know, make a big change for, for others. Because I knew that time that, you know, the beginning, it was not really noticed about, you know, this issue, but I knew that, Sooner or later, stories were gonna come out in public, you know, and it's gonna turn big. The amazing part is you were, I know you well enough probably that you weren't only thinking about yourself even then, you were already thinking about others that might be in the same situation and how yeah. you have to have an action for it. Congressman, how did you, what do you remember? What, how did you get to know Isabel and, and the story and the 33 days clock ticking? Tell us about your part in this and how, you're, how you came into it. Well, first off, thank you for inviting me um, to this. And um, Isabel, it's just always a joy. She's, um, I'm a big fan. Uh, just a little history for me. Um, I have had a wonderful relationship with the disabled community for since I was a county supervisor uh, many years ago uh, when we were in a recession. Um, our health department here in Contra Costa suggested that we had to close uh, two um, centers that were very popular. Uh, one in Concord, California, where, which I represent now and did represent then, and one in Richmond. Uh, they were named after uh, my predecessor's father, um, George Miller, who was a state senator who in uh, the 50s and 60s was an advocate for the disabled community and really had a lot of involvement with the wonderful model that we have here in California uh, for independence and respect for the disabled community. So I got to meet the disabled community there. And then when I was in the state legislature, um, I had the budget subcommittee in health and human services uh, during the last recession. And it actually was uh, the most wonderful thing before I met Isabel I've ever done in my uh, career because the DD community was so effective. Um, and I, I always attributed it to uh, being effective and smart and strategic. But when we had those hearings in Sacramento that had huge turnout, uh, the DD community was the community that showed up, um, but advocated as Isabel does in such a strategic way, but also the gift of empathy. Uh, I think because of the families and the individuals uh, for their physical challenges, they have, um, in my view, uh, compensated with those uh, disproportionately with their um, 
great spirit and their empathy. So they understood when we were negotiating those cuts that we had to make, and it was a real accomplishment because we were able to make those cuts in the least impactful way to services and to into through that recession. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you have a long uh, my, my Republican colleague uh, used to tease me because um, everybody from um, uh, from Contra Costa would come up. Uh, and they had t-shirts with my face on it. And uh, I, they said they were Dessonier fans. And I said, no, they're more like stalker fans because they were so just wonderful people that I've continued to have a wonderful relationship with. So that all led into this experience. Um, I just remember hearing about it from, I walked into the, our district office in Walnut Creek and our great staff there and our district director, uh, Chanel Scales Preston, um, they were talking about what had just happened and they had been told about it uh, and they were trying to work through the issue on the deferred action clients and there were a number of them in our district but Isabel of course stood out because of her background um, I had yet to I literally had just walked into the office and uh, they told me what was happening they told me the um, the people they usually dealt with in region 9 the west coast um, uh, people in the federal government and the then in Trump administration were trying to figure out what all this meant as well. Um, many of whom we had a relationship with uh, the non-political appointees. And then it just took off from there. Uh, I, I think I went from zero to 60 in about five minutes when I heard specifically Isabel's story and just said, you know, this is, this is really not right. Uh, so that's how it started. And then, um, it just evolved from there. And she, Isabel was really a, a national and international um, figure in a short period of time that was, and the policy of course was directed in a haphazard way from the Trump administration. And I think from the president as well, uh, that's just my opinion. Um, it wasn't directed at uh, disabled people as much as it was um, against immigration and people of um, different ethnicities. So. Um, it was because we were able to unite with colleagues. Uh, Ayanna Presley, a member of Congress from Boston, had a client, had a uh, constituent um, and who testified in the hearing with Isabel. But Isabel was always a star. She was always, she was the face. She got on national news. And I was just trying to be supportive. And her family is so terrific as well. <sighs> So we have the, the cause, we have the issue, we know what mountain you guys want to move. And what specifically for each of you are the next steps? And may, maybe you work in a coordinated fashion on it, maybe not. You <clears throat> have the lawmaker on the inside and the advocacy that you have to kind of do on the inside and, and how you have to position in the political moves. And then you have the advocate on the outside with the grassroots and kind of drumming up media and everything else and um maybe congressman you could start what you know that you can share with us what were some of the things that you knew you had to do what were some of the next steps if you knew that you wanted to do this and maybe specifically in congress or getting the other partners you already mentioned some other colleagues of yours what were some of the some, some of the things you knew you had to do well, one of the fortunate things for this was I was on, on one of the committees of jurisdiction, the oversight committee. So I went to the chair of that committee, a wonderful member, Elijah Cummings from Baltimore, who I had a good personal relationship with, God, he's passed away, um, who had his own physical challenges. Uh, so he was, he was very sympathetic. Um, so there was that. And then once Isabel and her mom and their team, their attorney, uh, and we talked, um, we just tried to work together as much as possible, hand in glove, and not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, so that was sort of the inside outside game. And um, yeah, it worked really well. And, and I think we all focused on the urgency for Isabel, but also all of the people, as you have said, who were caught in this particular instance. And then in a larger way, so much of this is about education, is explaining to people who haven't had the experiences that we have with this wonderful community explaining that these are full wonderful human beings just because they're restricted in a physical way um, shouldn't inhibit anybody from um, underestimating their power. 
Isabel, how about you? What were, um, you knew what you wanted to do now. You had already, one action you took, you spoke with the congressman, you and your mom, and what were some of the other things? What, how else, obviously this giant, I mean, you're literally taking on the federal government. How? Well, there, were, there were a couple, there were a couple, a couple of steps that I had to take before, you know, like, like, like we were talking about, like we, when we talked to Carmen and Sonia about the issue, um, I was already in the media, you know, spotlight, but I had to take a moment to really process everything, but I didn't have much time because like I said, it was only 33 days. So I really need to act really fast and prepare my mind of what was coming next, right? So the first thing I did that I always do every night is pray. I'm, I'm really, you know, I pray to God, like, please just help me, you know, walk through this, you know, walk through this fire. That was one. Number two is my mind is like, okay, how am I gonna keep my family, you know, safe, right? And even if I have to go and speak, you know, and testify like I did, I in that moment I had to do, you know, I have to, you know, it's kind of funny because I always been this this advocate, you know, for others, but I knew that this time around, I'm advocating for myself, right? So, and then, but at the same time, my mind was also thinking about the other family going through the same situation. So, like, I'll be honest, I really didn't have much time to really process everything because it was kind of crazy in the time, but I knew that the next step was to do, um, was to do the hearing, you know, the testifying, and it was like an emergency situation. So, my mom and I, we flew to DC, and as you all know, I, you know, shared my story and, um, you know, the situation and got to do what you got to do. But I feel like in, in that moment, it was not about, you know, me having a rare disease or anything, but I feel like it was about, you know, no matter where you come from, no matter, you know, what race you have, you have to right to speak up and have justice. And I feel like what happened to me in that time was just not right, you know? And and it was just that moment, like, you know, like forget about, you know, that you have a rare disease, like it's all you have a voice and you just have to use it and take some action. So that was kind of like my mindset. And with the media, like I'll be honest with you, I try not to really read much the comments at that time. Um, because I was just more worried about my, you know, my mentally safety in this crazy ride. But um, yeah, so that was where I was. Yeah. At that time. So sources of power kind of being our theme. I obviously the congressman had a position on the committee and, and a relationship with the chair, and the chair was uh, gracious enough to take up the issue, and. And of course, it's about talking about your own personal power and internal power, and and then also um, kind of relying on your faith and relying on your family as well. Um, tell us about. I mean, that that hearing was incredible. It, it seen obviously, Congressman has been in part of and seen lots of hearings. I've watched a lot of hearings, but that one just rose to a different level. I felt of empathy, Isabella, mostly because of you sharing your story. Um, can you guys just share a little bit each of you know, your thoughts during that hearing itself? Well, I remember Carmen and Sonia was helping me, like how does it work? Remember with the bottom, with the microphone, like make sure you press this one and everything. Because like I said, it was completely new, new for me. Like I know I've been, I think I've been doing like a couple here in Sacramento um, in the state, but not in this, you know, high, you know, level. So I just remember Carmen and Senate was, you know, showing me around, you know, with the buttons and microphones and everything, but I was very nervous. I was so nervous. I was, I think, I think I froze. There was a moment that I saw the plate and then I turned around and my mom is like, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. So I went to the restroom and behind the scene thing was that I went to the restroom and I put a good song and I did that the restroom. What song, what, like, song, what song did you play? We want to know. <laughs> Beyonce, who, who run the world, girls. <laughs> and then I lifted it at the restroom, and then I was like, okay, now I feel like energy, and then I was ready to 
to share the my story. And then I think at the end, I got to meet you know, amazing people like. During the period. Yeah. So. Yeah. I know. Like, I was, because I was very nervous to speak because there were so many people in front of me. But I kept looking at, um, you know, AOC a lot. And then she, and then she saw mm -hmm. me. And then she, after the hearing, she walked towards me and we just kind of like talked for a little bit and took a photo. So that was really, that was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, Congressman? I can only imagine hearing the back and forth. And there was obviously politics happening at the same time, you know, throughout the hearing. And what were you thinking and feeling going through that? Uh, well, first of all, it was just such a special, special hearing. Um, in addition to AOC and Congressman Presley and uh, to Congresswoman Tlaib, um, uh, uh, Jamie Raskin, who's now become um, yeah. very familiar to the rest of the world, a wonderful, wonderful, who has had his challenges that have been very public in his family. Um, and so he actually chaired the hearing, uh, it was a subcommittee of the full uh, committee that Elijah was the chair of and Elijah was there um, in and out. So it was just a, it was really, um, I, I guess a lot of my emotions that day was trying to control my temper. Uh, I was so angry at the administration and um, and the people who were there representing uh, the administration, quite frankly. I, um, I, I quoted one of my favorite quotes from Dante that said uh, the darkest, the hottest places are hell in hell are reserved for people who remain neutral in moments of moral uh, crisis. And I felt like I used that quote because it was directed at them, um, sort of implying, well, I know you've got to pay a mortgage, but you're being asked to do something, implement something really horrible. Uh, so, um, but you know, all that melted away because of, um, there was a lot of empathy in that room. It, as I look back on it, uh, people who um, just connected and and Isabel, uh, all of the testimony was remarkable, but I think everyone agreed that uh, we were in the presence of a special human being. Um, and that special human being was being attacked for political purposes. So it's quite remarkable. And then I'll just admit, to, I've teased uh, Isabel about this a little, congressional sibling rivalry because um, AOC Alexander is a wonderful member. We became friends and quickly. And I said, come on, I wanna introduce you to Isabel because I knew they would hit it off right away. And because of both my age and my gender, I knew I'd be a little separate from that. But uh, it was funny if they just connected right away across the table. And I I was pouty face because I'm like, I'm jealous. You guys are getting along so well. <laughs> but it was really a wonderful moment. And I, I think from that hearing, and from the feedback I got from people of goodwill within the administration who were not comfortable with it, uh, that hearing got to the White House into the Oval Office. And I, I think there was a political calculation that uh, we need to back off of this. Yeah, and something really important that I almost forgot saying this, but it was very, um, very important to me. Um, I don't know if you remember this comment, but in the hearing, AOC, asked me a question saying that if I knew a girl named Mariel from New York and at that moment I was thinking Mariel Mariel and I know um, someone named Mariel from New York that she has also in PS6 and she wrote a letter to AOC saying my name is Mariel I know Isabel we were together at, in the clinical trial you know when everything started it so so that was very amazing and then after the hearing I, I text you know Maria and I told her that AOC talk about her letter. So that was very meaningful. I think overall, and that's something I'm, I'm always gonna be so grateful is the community, like everyone that, you know, all the support and love when all this crazy thing was happening. Like I'm very grateful to my community, my church, my nurses at the hospital organization, Congressman Desanian and his staff, like all, all the team, my lawyer, everyone who really came together, um, you know, um, I. And then Anna Presley, you know, all everyone too, that were there supported and the love for everyone. I'd be so grateful. So I'm going to ask you guys about the outcome in just a little bit. But so you just mentioned, Isabel, that your <laughs> friend in New York wrote a letter to AOC about mm -hmm. the hearing writing. Let's talk about that. How did she know? The media. 
the, she the knew media. the media. Yeah. Okay. So she heard about it. Yeah. And so another element, just connecting the pieces, obviously there was a grassroots campaign happening as well. You were already part of, part of your power came from as a, you were already part of your organization that. MPS, um, yeah. Yeah. And, and not only that, you were heavily involved with it, a leader in that. And it was a national, it's a national organization. So it was an international. Yeah, well, it's a national MPS, yeah, national. MPS society. Yeah, it's a group of advocates. But so, they, go, they, do, they go to DC. So you already had a network of advocates of a grassroots coordinated network out there throughout the country that when the time came, that's also another source of power that obviously you relied on and that, that helped in the, the ultimate effort and result in the ultimate outcome. Let's talk about that. Um, it's about what, what happened after that. Okay. So after the hearing, I, I came home, right? And it was a little crazy the first week because everyone recognized who I was at the beginning, like at the grocery or stores, so everything. So um, it took me a moment to really adjust. And then we didn't hear much like the first, you know, weeks about what was going to happen you know, after the testify. And there was a delay and then a delay. And then I think by December 2nd or 6th, around the first week of December, that's when my family and I, we got the our letter for reunion, re, renew for two more years. So the program was back place. Yeah. So you got that letter. And Congressman, how did you hear about that result? Did you already know that that was gonna be the outcome or how did you hear of the change in policy? Uh, no, I, I didn't know until fairly late in the process, but I, I did, we did get a heads up. Um, the, the, previous administration did not work with uh, a lot of members in Congress. Anyone who disagreed with them terribly close, uh, they, they weren't, um, I'm choosing my words here. The current administration works more closely. Uh, so um, it, that's how I heard basically was just before uh, it became public. Well, I mean, ultimately that means that together the, the two of you, I mean, you really did, you, you changed a federal policy and for um, you know, a member of Congress that I, I imagine you're involved with changing policies all the time, but something so specific that impacts such a, you know, uh, individual lives in such a meaningful way um, to be able to change that so quickly, even that I imagine is pretty unusual um, in policy making. So it, well, successful in your efforts, what, obviously there's people with, with disabilities, people without disabilities, people who are attending this conference and they see challenges, they see whether it's the federal government or their school district or whether it's the sidewalk cutout or the bus schedule or anything in front of them that seems like a huge mountain to move. And um, what are some of the things you guys learned through this process that you would say worked and you think others would benefit from hearing you? you guys share? Um, I, I learned, I learned, well, first of all, I learned um, mm -hmm. to not be afraid to speak up, use your voice, because um, you can help someone else in needs. And then I use a quote myself too from that experience that says, be the change you want to see in the world. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes we wait for others to do the change, but sometimes you're the one who has to make the change. So be the change you want to see in the world will be very helpful. Wonderful. Thanks. <laughs> uh, how could you not want to support her? I mean, yeah. <laughs> right? She, Isabella, that smile made a, made a president of the United States crumble. Um, <laughs> it's I, I, I uh, just from my experience, I, we're, we're using quotes. Uh, Alexander de Tocqueville said famously one of my favorite quotes when he came to the United States and wrote his book about democracy in America. He said the, the America is based on a very simple premise. You can expect extraordinary things from ordinary people. And I can think of no better example than this, except that um, Isabel's not an ordinary human being.
being for anyone who interacts with her. She's extraordinary on multiple levels. I did want to mention the last question um, just came back to me how I heard uh, my ledge director who worked on this, um, on Isabel's case in DC. She sent me a text, text and told me, um, and uh, she had a note. She said, uh, boss, you saved her life. And uh, I started crying. I said, no, no, we saved a life including Isabel and her family. So really remarkable, wonderful, wonderful outcome. We do have one more piece of work to do specifically for Isabel. I've introduced a bill every session. Uh, it's called a private bill, but specifically for Isabel, uh, making sure that um, this would never happen again and allow her and her family to stay here permanently. Uh, we were unable to get Senator McConnell in the Senate, even though it passed out of the House last session, but we um, are going to do it again, and we're hopeful, given the change in the Senate, that it will actually go through and by, be signed by President Biden, which will be, um, at least for this story, the best, best ending. What an incredible. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Yeah can only imagine what that would be like for you and your family. Yeah, well, it, it, it could be cool because I remember that when I was vice president, Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. um, she heard about my story and she put it on her social media. And when I saw that, I'm like, that's really cool, you know? <laughs> you know? So, um, yeah, so I'm very excited. But going back to your last question, I just want to add something important, um, Jordan. Um, for those people that are listening to this conference and everything, I think my best advice is, like I said, don't be afraid to use your voice, um, be the change you want to see in the world, and get involved in your community, you know, a lot, you know, I mean, that's how I started in my advocacy journey, and I mean, I went through, you know, obviously my community with MPS, but then I was involved in school, uh, spreading the word of uh, awareness about rare diseases. I was the founder of the scholarship in the university. Um, and also organization to like the the advocacy with um with the National MPS Society, go to you know capital, you know, when there's like special events um to get involved. I mean there's so many ways to be in a community and be your own voice of support. Well, we're about to hear from your mother in just a minute as well about um, her story alongside both of you. But um, Isabel, you're an inspiration and we are grateful that you're able to share your story with us and more grateful that you're able to be with us and continue to be a leader in the wider, larger disability community across the country. And Congressman, just, uh, you know, you're, you're an inspiration for our community as well as a policymaker as a lawmaker who stops and listens actually and, and takes the time and effort and, and not just for a big policy idea but for a single individual and um, you demonstrated that when you were in California in the state legislature and you're obviously doing the same out in DC so we thank you for that as well and thank you guys so much both for joining us any last minute uh, parting thoughts Isabel um. You already gave us a good one. All right. You can be your own your own leader in your in your community. Just know that, you know, like you ever think that you don't have the power or you know anything that's wrong. You have something very special. Yeah. To make a difference in your community. Absolutely. Be your own leader. That's what that's one of my favorite. Be your own leader. I like that too. Yeah. Thank you both so much for joining us and um, please keep us updated. I'm sure others will want to hear as well about how uh, the bill continues to go uh, so we can share with our community. Thank, Thank you for you what you do. Thank you for everybody for Thank what you all do. It's inspiring. Bye, Isabel. Bye. I love that time with Isabel and Congressman DeSaulnier, what amazing people. And that was just, um, Isabel's story is incredible. I, I highly encourage you guys to look online and see her testimony in the House of Representatives. Um, she went back and forth. She mentioned her interaction with AOC, which was um, a real, real special interaction. And then also um, she just commanded, I, I mean, if you watch testimonies in the House of Representatives before, 
she commanded the entire room. It was incredible. Um, we are also honored right now to be joined by Carla Boiso, uh, Isabel's mother and my friend. And we have a few minutes with Carla to answer some of your questions. So there is the Q&A down in there. Hello, Carla. There is the Q&A. Hi, Q &A. Everyone. Hi Jordan. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Thank you for so, having me. Oh, I love to have you here right now. And so uh, people, if you have questions about this story, this experience, now's the time to ask Carla. Carla, as a mom, talk to us about, we have a few minutes, like this is, must have been horrifying. And then ultimately this long process and then a good outcome. Tell us how it was as a parent. It was quite an experience. It was very devastated. Um, it was a very difficult time, uh, especially because um, it involved so many things. Uh, we received a letter uh, that tell us that we were denied an extension of state, but in addition to that, to be forced to leave the country in 33 days. Um, I was terrified because uh, I was thinking not only about Isabel's weekly treatment uh, that keeps her alive, but also about uh, the lack of specialists. Uh, Isabel has uh, many, many health problems and uh, she, really needed. It was really hard to imagine to be in a different um, a country without uh, everything that Isabel needed, especially her treatment that is not available in Guatemala. Well, I know that in the in the testimony and others in the media, I mean, they, they called it a, a life sentence, you know, for Isabel, a, a, literally a death sentence for Isabel to be sent back to Guatemala without her life-saving treatment. And so as a parent, you fought, and I asked Isabel the same question. And you know, you and Carla, you and I, Carla, go way back. Um, so I, I feel like I know. And and I remember getting the call from you saying, Jordan, this is happening. We just got this letter. I think it was the day you got the letter. I'm not sure. Yes, Jordan. We met in Partners and Policy. I was your student. <laughs> you were my mentor. Uh, you teach me. You give me the tools. Um, but you fought. So where did that come from for you as a parent? Parents always. Uh, Parents, especially of children with disabilities, seem like it's it's a constant fight. But where does that come from for you? Where does that power come from? First and of all, it was uh, to see the injustice. Uh, Isabel came to this country to participate in a clinical trial uh, as the study was successful and the medicine was approved by the FDA. So in some way, Isabel kind of paved the ways for others. And getting that letter is like, feels like somebody was kicking you out of the country. So it's, it's hard because she was making a contribution and this, and she got that response. So it was really, really hard to process all that. Yeah. But I'm happy that um, we, we were having such a great community. We're so grateful with all the support. I remember that you were on board and thank you so much for ARC, you know, uh, other organizations, uh, Congressman De Sonia's office, he has been like an angel to us. And um, we hope that uh, we don't have, we do never have to go through this again. And that the story has a really good ending and that we could be allowed to remain in this country in a permanent way. Um, it was, uh, it was hard, it was really hard. I know a lot of people uh, look at that like, uh, that was good, you know, like to speak up, to uh, go there, tell your story. And I think that that's the way that everything should, everybody should do that. But um, nobody sees sometimes the other side of the, the coin and uh, it was a terrifying moment also to see your daughter um, in that big room fighting for her life. Isabel has been fighting all her life for with all her health problems and here she is fighting for an opportunity to um, stay alive because without the treatment um, Isabel will die. Yeah well you and Isabel have been an inspiration and 
um, in the chat, I'm going to post her a, a link to her testimony in the, in the house. People can watch later today because that's um, that's it's just a really inspirational moment to see her interacting and just holding her ground. Um, it was really amazing. And uh, we have some in the questions and answers. We have people just thanking you, Carla, for your advocacy. Uh, and questions, and, and I'll kind of paraphrase this question, where do you go from here? What, what do you, you know, going forward into 2021, what, what do you and your family do now? Well, uh, this girl has so many plans. She wanted to continue to advocate for uh, the rare disease and disability community. She's always on top trying to um, uh, suggest the legislator for new laws in order to open more doors and to make the life of others uh, better. So I think that uh, this is the result of, and as I said, I think I started this with you. <laughs> and um, I, I, I think right now, uh, Isabel has a job as a patient advocate specialist. Um, and um, I think she will continue to see what needs to be done. And as she said, you got to do what you got to do. That's her thing, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, Carla, thank you for joining us. Isabel, Congressman de Saulnier, uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing this amazing story of, and our theme today is power and um, the incredible demonstration of, and we titled this session, Moving Mountains. When the federal government sends you family a letter and says, you're leaving the country. That's a big mountain in front of you. And you guys found power through a lot of different ways. Isabel mentioned her faith. Um, you guys got in touch with Congressman Sonia. You found you had your networks and you guys moved that huge mountain in front of you, which is an inspiration to, as I mentioned earlier, everyone who's dealing with what's right in front of them as a mountain um, for themselves and their families. So. Thank you for being with us today and uh, demonstrating to us through your story. Thank you for having me again. Bye. Seeing you, Carla.